Good morning, everyone. Thank, welcome to today's Think Tech Hawaii Talk, Law Across the Sea program. Today, we're going to be having an in-depth look at WeChat, the app, the ban, and the legal battle against the ban. My name is Elizabeth Chen Hale. I will be your host today. I previously appeared on this program to talk about the WeChat and the TikTok ban, and I'm very honored to have two very knowledgeable speakers to share with about the, having an in-depth look at the WeChat ban. Um, before my, my, I'm a patent attorney by training myself. I'm also a graduate of the Richardson School of Law of the University of Hawaii. Um, so my first speaker uh, is Clay Drew, who is the attorney and managing partner of the Hun Law Office. Uh, Clay specializes in cross-border merger, acquisition, export control, corporate compliance, commercial litigation, international tax. But most relevant to, the, to today's process, uh, he's one of the founders of the U.S. WeChat Users Alliance, who successfully procured a preliminary injunction against the government's attempt to implement the ban. My second speaker is Chen Gu. Chen is currently of counsel at the international law firm of Appleton and Loft. Prior to pra private practice, he had a long and successful career as in-house counsel, serving for famous companies such as Western Digital, Line. Most relevant today, he was the former senior counsel for Tencent America. In that role, he supported Tencent's U.S. patent practice, managing of the portfolio and the standard recession patents. And uh, before we launch into the discussion on the ban, I will say a few words about the background and why we're here today. So on August 6th of this year, President Trump, citing the authority vested in him through the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and the National Emergency Act, decided to put a ban on activities of WeChat, the app, the app in the United States. The reason um, cited in the order was that WeChat, which is a powerful messaging, social media, and the electronic payment application, which is owned by a Chinese parent company, Tencent. And uh, it has, enjoys worldwide popularity, has over 1 billion users, uh, across the globe. And uh, unfortunately, according to the government, WeChat also captures a vast amount of user information, therefore creating a national security risk. So I think this is a good time to turn the discussion, direct the questions to my uh, my guests here. Um, Chen, I, I think you're a good person to start since you kind of can give us the, the inside scoop about Tencent, uh, the technology, the company, and uh, it's it's impact. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Tencent is, uh, as you mentioned, is a um, international company. Uh, its main headquarters is based in Shenzhen, China, um, but it's uh, operating internationally um, for its business uh, out of mostly Hong Kong. Um, the Tencent Group, um, the international business has today uh, approximately uh, 70,000 employees uh, as of June this year. Uh, it's been growing for the last probably four or five years at a rate of 10,000 employees per year. Um, I, I see recently that they just opened a new office in Holland and they're hiring like crazy. <laughs> um, their annual revenue is approximately um, in the tune of 50, eight uh, billion dollars us um the wechat program is a relatively new phenomenon um uh, can we see the slide related to this yeah so the wechat program was launched uh in 2011 and it included basic features like all social media uh chat programs like chatting and voice and video and call um, currently, it has approximately 1.2 billion users per, active users per month. 
in some of its uh, interesting features in WeChat includes the WeChat payment uh, feature, which la was launched in 2013. And it currently has about 800 million users, active users per month. And it's accounting for 1.1 billion transactions. Uh, do we lose the, uh, the slides? Okay. There. Okay. That. <laughs> yeah, 1.1 1, 1 billion transactions per month. And in last year, um, this was a personal estimate that I did of, uh, based upon its revenue. It would, um, the WeChat payment program uh, generated somewhere around 12 trillion US dollars. And this year it's looking like it's on track to about uh, 15 trillion US dollars in revenue. Uh, it's it's a tremendous amount of money being pumped through the um, the e-commerce side of uh, WeChat essentially, and in 2016 um, WeChat launched the mini program, uh, which is basically these tiny programs that can you don't need to install but you can run inside of WeChat, and this feature now has somewhere around 300 million users per day. And it includes somewhere around 2 million mini programs. And it generates uh, in the tune of uh, $115 billion US in last year. And some of the more newer features in WeChat includes the blockchain encrypted electronic receipts, which is used to uh, um, uh, kind of prevent financial fraud in a WeChat payment. Um, and uh, there's also a feature now uh, that's kind of minor, but interesting. Um, China now implements a fully mobile court system with uh, artificial intelligent judges uh, in the mini program. Um, this has been used now across 12 provinces in China. And uh, essentially anyone can file uh, civil lawsuits or small claims uh, through the mini program of the mobile court system. And 90% of the cases are basically disposed by artificial intelligent judges uh, because they have no fact of controversies. Um, and the other 10%, uh, they are allowed to go to online video hearings and et cetera. So these are all very interesting features that we don't really see a whole lot in some of the uh, the US-based uh, social media uh, apps. Um, it makes WeChat's influence also very, very powerful inside of China because uh, predominantly most of the users are in China. Right, I think people who haven't been to China recently probably don't realize how powerful this app is. Because China, for the most part, is on a paymentless system now, contactless, which we're going to. But we're still using credit cards. But people there use their phone and their WeChat app. And it's really hard to do anything, even to get a meal, without the WeChat. So, Clay, um, you're based in Silicon Valley. So you're one of the happy users of WeChat. But um, do you use WeChat that extensively? And is that why you decided to found this uh, US WeChat Users uh, Alliance to stop uh, the ban? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I probably spend on average three to four hours a day on WeChat uh, for business reasons, for personal reasons, because uh, I represent mostly companies from China to do business in the US. Uh, I also maintain contacts with my family, my friends back in China. Um, I think my WeChat uh, is also a very powerful platform for me to post messages that I want to reach the people to because I'm very active on a lot of political and other issues. So this is very uh, personal to me. Okay. Is that a primary reason for you to, to starting this alliance? Uh, the alliance was started, uh, I think, very quickly and spontaneously because of the uh, executive order issued by uh, the president on August 6th. Uh, we started the alliance two days later, and I actually wrote a legal memo uh, within 24 hours on how to challenge this uh, executive order. Um, the reason, of course, not only because WeChat is so important to me, 
and to the Chinese American communities in the US. But also I, the exact order, um, it really ticked me off in a way that, uh, because it is, I believe it is racially motivated. Uh, as we know that uh, the president has, has done a lot of things against China and against Chinese Americans in the past uh, a year or so. Um, 2020 has been the climax of all the discriminatory policies and actions being taken by the government. And the WeChat executive order is one of the things I believe is being racially motivated and it's not really based on national security. Okay, so I guess I'll turn the question back to Chen as it's fine. Chen, you were in charge at least of the US patent portfolio. Do, do you see, from, from your assessment, and you're no longer with Tencent, so you can probably give us an objective assessment. Do, do you really think this app presents a national security risk? Is the pre was the president right in, in saying that? Um, I personally don't believe it's any worse in terms of security um, for users um, uh, compared to say to any of the other social media uh, applications we have in the US such as WhatsApp and all that. Uh, now there are cybersecurity reports and privacy reports done on uh, comparing WhatsApp as well as iPhone Messenger and also WeChat. And some of the security experts have noted that WeChat, unlike WhatsApp, is a end-to-server encryption uh, social media chat program. And they s claim that it's somehow worse. Um, but we all know that uh, social media companies like uh, Facebook in WhatsApp, they gather users' data regardless of whether or not it's end-to-end -end encryption or end-to-server encryption. And this has been uh, noted in some previous tech uh, dissects about uh, WhatsApp. Um, now, what most people do not realize is um, most social media companies, as well as high tech companies, they gather users' data using what's known as aggregate data collection, meaning uh, they anonymize the user information. The private information of the users are essentially taken out. So even though they are gathering your data, like your behavior, they don't know that it's particularly you. What they see is, you know, they'll say, oh, these are the millions of users who are looking for these information, or these are the millions of users who are chatting about this particular topic or something. And that's what they care about. They, they don't really care who is actually doing it, but they, um, they do keep track of what is being discussed and what is, uh, you know, talked about in the relevant information. So as far as I know, um, WeChat is gathering aggregate data uh, across essentially billions of its users. And um, it uses this information for uh, advertising purposes as well as some content removal uh, purposes. And some people will call it censorship, yes. Um, but it's in effect, you know, Twitter does content moderation as well as a uh, number of different US social media companies that are even Reddit or uh, some of the conservative uh, news media companies that they also moderate the content on their social media platforms. Uh, they remove inappropriate uh, or misleading information. And that's what WeChat program does in itself as well. Uh, I do have well, to say that the artificial intelligent technology behind WeChat's content moderation is actually very good. And it's, it is very uh, good at detecting uh, what they think is considered to be bad information. Whether you like whether or not they're um, getting rid of some of the information, that's a different criteria. The AI, the AI doesn't care. Um, it just knows which type of information it's supposed to get rid of. But in terms of its algorithm technology, it is much better than some of the other US uh, technology companies. Right. I would like to flesh out, um, given Chen's explanation and Clay's point that there's a 
racial component. I will probably put it more as a cultural component. Uh, I think part of the concern, even with Chen's explanation that, you know, this technology may even be more protective of users than WhatsApp, for example, or Twitter or what have you. I, I think there is a distrust uh, on the US side that the US, well, the Chinese government has a much closer relationship with its high tech companies and that will form the ground of suspicion. And that's for either one of you to, to comment. Do, do you think that's true? So in, in a way, you know, which has been singled out because there's that cultural difference. Uh, question to me? Either one of you, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think the suspicion of the Chinese government, uh, its relationship with high tech company, I think it's legit to some extent, but it is not enough. Again, um, from the very beginning, from the first day I organized this campaign, uh, from the day we filed the lawsuit, we made it very clear that we do not represent Tencent. We have no relationship with the Chinese government. We're just here trying to protect the average users of WeChat in the US. So, I mean, from the foreign policy standpoint of view, you can have legitimate discussion with the Chinese government on how to say, remove this suspicion, but it is not enough to uh, infringe upon the American WeChat users' First Amendment rights under the Constitution. Right, that goes back to your lawsuit. I believe you won the preliminary injunction, not on the other grounds, but in particular on the First Amendment rights ground, correct? That's so right. you think this is really a civil rights litigation, protecting the user's uh, First Amendments. And how about the other, for example, the vested, the vested power vested in the president through the AIPA? Um, yeah, AIPA is a, actually is a related issue. The AIPA has uh, given the president authority to impose economic sanctions on foreign adversaries in a emergency situation. But there is a limitation to such the uh, presidential power. One of them is the president shall not interfere or prohibit uh, personal communications. Uh, that, ex that restriction is actually comes from the First Amendment. It's the same logic. If you read the legislative history, the AIPA restriction and exemption that placed upon the presidential power is in line with the First Amendment. Uh, even though we made the same arguments in our briefs, I think our First Amendment argument is, is strong enough for the judge to make that uh, decision. In the TikTok case, the judges used the AIPA uh, grounds to uh, issue the preliminary injunction. I think it is very similar I and mean, in line and consistent with the uh, reasoning behind the judge uh, make the decision in our case. And Chen, do you have uh, any additional insights on the relationship between Chinese high-tech companies and the government, the Chinese government, of course? Um, I think the concern is somewhat legitimate, uh, although I would not say China is necessarily unique in that situation. Um, under Chinese law, um, if a company is a certain size in terms of number of employees, I believe only a few hundred, uh, it is required by law to have a uh, Communist Party representative committee in, among its employees to uh, uh, be established in the company. Uh, this is not necessarily to say that this employee committee will interfere with the running of the company itself, but it is a sort of a mechanism for um, monitor of employee rights because the Communist Party of China does technically represent uh, sort of the the workers' union in a sense. Um, so, in in terms of that fact, um, and I'm not going to necessarily say how many percentage of uh, Tencent employees are Communist Party members. It is actually a astonishingly large number. Uh, it, which is not a surprise because uh, given that a majority of uh, Chinese high-tech uh, university graduates are actually Communist Party members, 
uh, you would expect that for a Chinese high tech company like Tencent with 70,000 employees, uh, there will be a significant portion of the employee base who are Communist Party members. And uh, when I was in China for uh, a month or so, uh, I actually came into contact with some of the Communist Party member employees of uh, Tencent. Um, they have a club. Uh, they actually, uh, their only sole activity is not some like secret meeting to discuss party politics, is, is to basically to have a movie night every weekend. <laughs> uh, they give out free tickets. And the, so that's, you know, it's a social club kind of thing. Um, but I would say this type of organization and the, the, uh, the Chinese government's connection to its high tech company, it's no worse than necessarily say US companies, their connection to US companies. Uh, I would urge everyone to know that, you know, Apple or Intel have uh, a lot of ex government employees in their uh, in their current employee uh, sections. Uh, some of them have actually previously worked for uh, the defense uh, department or even the CIA or the NSA. Uh, it's not surprising uh, if we apply the same logic to US uh, companies, uh, I think people would think that's crazy. You know, it's like if the Chinese government say, oh, Apple cannot do business in China because it has a lot of these US, ex US government people or ex US military people who are now working for Apple, right? And that will be kind of very paranoid in a sense. Right. I mean, I, I used to work for Apple. We, we certainly, I certainly noticed, especially in the government affairs branch uh, of the, the legal department, there are many, many uh, people who previously worked, not just for the American government, but for you know the Chinese government as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think what the U.S. audience, when they've confronted with the situation, you we do hear cases where, for example, when some the Department of Justice wants to crack open uh, iPhone for some security information, Apple was willing to stand up and, and and fought the government against that practice. And maybe given you know Chinese current political structure, and that's something that Americans may be looking but not seeing, and therefore concluding that these two, you know, the the company and um, and the government are much more in collusion in China than than elsewhere. But um, that, that that's a cultural difference. And again, going going back to to Clay, so I think you very smartly kind of didn't touch on this national security issue. You fought on the 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 stalwart of U.S. constitutional First Amendment amendment right. What, what, what is your um, what is your future litigation strategy? You won your preliminary injunction, so you put in a government at bay. Currently, what, what do you think is going to happen? What do you plan to do as a new administration comes in? Uh, we have a two-pronged strategy. Um, the legal strategy has already started, and we won the preliminary injunction. The case is now both pending in the district court as well as at the uh, Ninth Circuit. The U.S. government has appealed to the Ninth Circuit uh, about two months ago. Uh, they already lost one motion. They filed a new appeal uh, on the preliminary injunction again. And we're going to have a hearing in January. Hopefully, we'll have a decision sometime later in that month or sometime in February. Uh, at the same time, we have already been uh, in contact with the transition team of the new administration. Uh, I cannot divulge any details right now, but my hope is we can convince the new administration to withdraw that executive order because any future litigation would be futile and it would be a waste of government and judicial resources. Right. So I guess I'll throw the same question back to Chen. Let's say assuming, you know, I'm sure Clay has an extremely competent team and is most likely to succeed, that just argue for argument's sake, if that's not successful, Chen, what do you think, how do you think Tencent will respond if there is a ban? Are they kind of working on other apps that could replace WeChat, at least for the U US users? I heard rumors of that sort. Well, uh, I think the legal position um, from Tencent is that they segregate uh, the 
what they call the international version of the WeChat app from the domestic version called Weixing uh, app. So the, technically these are two apps because they run on two sets of servers that are completely separated from each other in terms of user data. Uh, all international WeChat users data are, are basically resident outside of mainland China, uh, mainly in uh, servers in Hong Kong. Uh, this is why, you know, if the U.S. government, say, requests WeChat users' uh, data, they have to go through the Hong Kong Tencent uh, legal department to do a data request uh, or for content removal. Um, this is how it's being handled in Tencent ever since, you know, when I joined the company, probably even before. Um, so Tencent's strategy is most likely going to be like, they're just going to say it's two different apps. Uh, if you want to ban the WeChat app, it will only result in banning the, the WeChat uh, international version, not the domestic uh, wishing program. It still presents a bit of a problem for, you know, all the users outside of uh, you, uh, mainland China, which is approximately 100 million users right now uh, on the uh, service. Um, but I don't know if they're going to try to roll out necessarily a new one to replace the WeChat program. I see. Thank you. Um, my pro the director of the program is telling me we have one minute left. I want to thank you for very much for joining me. I also want to give Clay the chance. Any last minute words uh, you want to leave with our audience today? Uh, I think the only statement I'm going to make here is that I hope the new administration will take a more pragmatic approach to the China-US relationship. I think that will resolve a lot of the disputes between those two countries as well as resolve this lawsuit. Great. Well, um, on behalf of uh, the Law Across the Sea program, I want to thank you too very much for spending your time and your knowledge, sharing your knowledge with us. And uh, happy holidays. Thank, Hope thank to you. See you again at the program soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.